Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Hey everybody, uh, happy Monday. Hope you guys had a wonderful day. Hope you guys had a wonderful weekend. I apologize for not getting this Bible study out yesterday as I was going through the notes and uh, you'll see in a moment um, when I was inputting uh, some scriptures in the, the study, I noticed that there were a few versions that, um, again, had, for whatever reason, removed some of the verses. And so I went back through and, you know, everything that I added, I made sure that, you know, the verses were actually in there rather than, you know, okay, copy, paste, and, you know, this is what we're going to talk about. So I went through, scoured through everything, and, um, yeah, it's all it's all good. Uh Big shout out to Raina Fambrini. Thank you for giving us that photo for the Bible verse image on the, the introductory uh, page there. Just want to say thank you. Stay safe and praying for you always. So as we get into this Bible study, you're going to see things in the blue font like I discussed in the first portion of it that it's stuff that's added, right? So this is going to be an expansive study, meaning we're going to, it's going to, continue to grow it's large and we're going to continue to work at it right this isn't just you know a document that we're going to file save and store somewhere this is something that we're going to be adding to right we're going to be working on so we can build our knowledge so just as that verse says right we have to guard our hearts but we have to know why we're guarding our hearts we have to learn we have to get into the reason for it so that we're not just guarding our hearts and blocking out all things right Guard our hearts against the things that would pull us away from God. Okay, Scripture says, be careful of the things that you do because you never know who you're entertaining. You could be entertaining an angel without knowing it, right? So we want to be able to recognize the influence. And obviously, yes, there are the fallen angels and there are those who are still in God's service. You want to be able to recognize the difference just as you can test everything in the spirit, right? You can kind of tell a person based on the fruits that they produce. You still want to be able to discern the things in the spirit that are good and things that are bad. And so as we get into this spiritual concepts, well, further into this, you'll see in the blue highlighted that we've added a few things and we're going a little bit more in depth. So some of the scriptures and the pastors are going to get a little bit longer as we go. Um, and eventually as we start getting down to where we start talking about the individual spiritual beings that are present, you'll see that everything is going to be based on the Bible. Everything's going to come back to scripture, but it's going to reach out and it's going to touch different books. It's going to touch different concepts, different things, and it's all going to be related back into scripture, right? So, uh, before we get started deep into this, let's open up with our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for just allowing us this opportunity. We thank you for allowing us to be able to catch the mistakes of man and be able to adjust and correct it so that we can get a full and accurate accounting of your word for our studies. Father, we ask that you uncover our eyes. We ask that you unstop our ears and allow us to soak in this knowledge, soak in the verses on the screen, soak in your message that is being that is being spoken. Um, one to me from you, and then, you know, by proxy from you to me to all who can hear, Father. We ask that you allow us to, like I said, digest so that that, that word can seep into us and transform us and help us to grow so that we can develop a more intimate and long lasting relationship with you. Help us so that we can recognize the plans and the schemes of the enemy, so that we can recognize when someone comes into our midst. And they are carrying, you know, the will of the devil or something, you know, an evil spirit that is influencing them. Father, help us to stand strong and stand firm in you so that we can recognize that and so that we can rebuke those things. We understand that not the person per se, but the influence that may be upon them. Father, we ask that you help us to shine as a light that is lit by you and that has continued to be fueled by you so that we can cast out the darkness in your name by the authority that Jesus has given us. Father, we love you, we bless you, we praise you with all of our hearts, our minds, our souls, our bodies, our spirits, and we ask that you continue to cover us and to watch over us in our comings and our goings. All this we ask and say in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 
All right, so let's get started. So as you can see, uh, towards the very bottom, Job chapter 1, verse 6 to 7. And this is still within that beginning of the spiritual concepts. And so there you see the different versions of Ephesians 6, 11. It's, it's reminding us that we're not here to fight people, right? We're here to deal with the strongholds of the enemy. We're here to deal with the principalities and all those powers that be that are in support of the plans and the schemes of the devil. And I want you to understand that when we talk about the devil, when we talk about the fallen angel, right, the leader of the fallen angels, Lucifer, understand that he is an angel. Understand that he was a guardian of the mercy. He was a chair. So he pretty much helped make the seat that God sat upon, right? And he wanted it for himself. And so he influenced other angels to rebel against God. And in their rebellion, obviously they lost. They were cast out of heaven. Some of the sources that we'll touch on later on are different works from different cultures that document um, things that were passed down, such as the war that took place in heaven, such as the information that came um, from the fallen angels and came from angels who were sent here uh, as messengers, as watchers, as principalities, different things to help us, to move us, and to grow us, right? So that we could fend off the uh, the advances of the devil. We could fend off the advances of the evils. That, well, evil one, the evils that are present in the world, right? And so, um, I want you to understand that the word Satan is adversary, right? And, perfect. We're going to do this. We're going to go right into it. It's not in the notes. We are going to look for the word Satan in here. In our strongest concordance. And this is kind of a cool little opportunity for us to do a in-person study here. Let's see. Set. Let's see. Satan. So in here, it automatically says Satan. Next to it is the adversary. And so 7854. 7854. That's going to be in the Hebrew. So let's go look for it. 7854. So as we get into this study, you'll see more and more of us getting into this strong importance like this because I don't want you to think that it's all just you know done on camera or off camera before it gets to you guys right so 7854 and it says here Satan Satan from 7853 an opponent 7853 it says Satan a primitive root to attack accuse adversary and then as we scroll through uh, 7854, it gives us several um, examples and, and def well, not definitions, examples and areas we can find it, right? So it says, Satan, the arch enemy of good. Satan, adversary, and it means to withstand, right? Satan is an adversary or plotter, one who devises means for opposition. Satan means adversary. Satan, in Psalms 38, 22, David cried out because he was the target of attack by his adversaries. They also, that render evil for good, are mine adversaries, because I follow the thing that good is. And then here, and I'll only read another one or two different examples, but in another psalm of distress by an individual, a godly man expressed his deep faith in the Lord. The writer prayed concerning those who were adversaries to his soul. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. That's Psalm 71.13. And then here it also says, He expressed the reality of the powers of darkness against an individual who sought to live for God. So when we speak about these spiritual concepts, when we start looking at the schemes, the plans, the wiles of the devil, right? Understand that the devil is Lucifer. Lucifer is a fallen angel. And so in here, it says that Satan is the devil, 
Lucifer, Satan. He is named, he's given the moniker Satan because of what he represents, right? He is at war with God. He is an adversary. He is the arch enemy of good, right? So just understand that. And again here, the reality of powers of darkness against an individual who sought to live for God. So you have to ask yourself, kind of like we talked about in, in um, what is your goal Bible study? What's your purpose for living? All right. Our purpose that God would have for us is to live, to glorify him, to seek relationship with him, to spread the news of the work that he had done in Jesus Christ, to sacrifice and bestow upon us salvation as a gift. But the devil would have us turn our backs on God and the devil would have us not be thankful and and stand proud and against God because the devil wants us to think that we are above God and in that thinking that we are above God we will be cast down just as he was he just like it says the phrase or the saying misery loves company right he doesn't want to be alone he knows that all those 200 angels that fell with him that one third of the angels they're going in for eternity Right? Scripture says that they're locked away based on their actions, waiting for the appointed time, and that's in Revelation. When you start seeing and understanding the different, the different ways that the devil goes, as we're talking about, you understand that he's not just going after one or two. He's going after everyone. He's casting a wide net. Right? There's many, many uh, examples and illustrations of fishermen in, in the Bible. But understand that the devil is also a fisherman. Understand that the devil wants to be like God and wants to copy God, but he's a false, he's a false, uh, you know, he's, he's a false image, if you will. He's a false God. He is, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for? He's a cheap imitator, right? And you think about this, there's going to be the second coming of Jesus. But then scripture also says that there's going to be the coming of the Antichrist. Understand that the devil is trying to sow seeds of dissension and discord amongst people so that we don't live in love. So as we talk about this more and get into the study, we'll get down to the point to where it, we talk about the devil as the author of confusion. And the Bible doesn't explicitly say that he's the author of confusion, but understand that he is the opposite of God, right? He is the arch enemy of good. God is good. And so in, in scripture, it says that God is not the author of confusion. He is not the sower of discord. That tells you that the devil is. He's trying to confuse and confound the minds and the souls of people so that they don't turn to God, so they don't run to God, so that they don't understand who it is that is supposed to be coming to save them, right? The whole reason why the devil is promoting the Antichrist is to trip people up. And you think about an imposter. They're going to do everything and anything in their power to try to trick you. They're going to sound like you. They're going to look like you. They're going to try to act and and copy the mannerisms of the person that you're expecting but if you don't know what jesus looks like and i'm not saying his outward appearance if you don't know him by the spirit if you don't know what feeling is going to come over you when he returns then it's going to be a very very difficult time and so we want to shape your mind and shape your perspective to focus on god to get to god to get in your bible get in your word and to grow in your spirit and your relationship with God, right? So, uh, Job chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 here. One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. Satan ans answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. The reason why he watches, the reason why he's going back and forth to and fro is because he's looking for people. Just like it says in 1 Peter 5, 8. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Right? So you think about that. Well, 
the devil's going around looking for everybody and anybody that he can sink his teeth into, right? But why was the devil allowed to go into the heavenly court? Well, because he's an angel. God called the angels to present themselves, right? And in that, you think about this. God knows what the devil's up to. God knows that the devil has schemes. But he took him in and said, hey, what are you doing? Oh, well, I'm looking for someone to, to take from you. Cool. And he offered up Job. Have you considered Job? Take a look at him. Take a look at his life. Anything and everything that you can do to him, he will not, he will not, will not, will not forsake me. He will not blaspheme against me. And so the devil says, all right, I'll take that bet. Let's, let's see it. Let's go. And so God says, do unto him as you will, but don't kill him. And as we get into this study a little bit further, you'll see exactly the kind of things that happen. So as we look at the schemes and the plans, notice that I added here health and circumstances, right? Health and circumstances. So be aware that the devil is going to try to bury you in your circumstances and inflict as much pain and discomfort as possible on you in your circumstances to get you to blame God. So now as we look so we've already gone through majority of what's in the red. But when we get down here into Mark 7, this is something new. It's added in the blue, right? I don't know why that one is there. But, oops, there we go. So Mark 7, verse 14 to 23. When he had called all the multitude unto himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And then I want you to understand that uh, verse 16 here. Oops. I was trying to highlight verse 16. If it will let me. There we go. All right, verse 16. This was not in uh, the NIV, the NLT. It was not in um, the NASB 2020. Uh, we had to go to King James and New King James just to ensure that this was in there without me having to type it and you know essentially alter anything, right? Um, but anyone, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, the reason why this verse is important and I think that it's an atrocity that's taken out is because he's not saying the able-bodied, right? He's saying those who are spiritually attuned to the wisdom that's being presented. And before we go further past 16, let's go back up here. The devil goes after your emotions, health, and circumstances, right? The emotion that we're going to be looking at here is... Uh, jealousy, looking at your heart. And the jealousy is more geared toward the Pharisees and Sadducees in which the conversation is pertaining to. They are, the Pharisees and Sadducees come to Jesus and say, well, you know, your disciples aren't following the edicts of the, of the law of Moses. And Jesus says, well, you're more concerned with what man is doing pertaining to what's written Versus what the Son of Man is telling you to do and telling that it's okay to do, which means that you're more concerned with perpetuating manly, godly, or manly things as opposed to godly things. And so when we look at verse 17, or continue with verse 17, when he had entered a house from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? But it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. Before we go past that, God has a hand in creating each and every one of us. It did not skip over God's understanding and wisdom and knowledge and ability to create a system that would 
go through and extract the things that we need and remove the the waste right to cleanse the body it's the heart that he is concerned with god is a heart knower and so when we look at verse uh 20 and he said what comes out of a man that defiles a man for from within out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts adulteries for fornications murders thefts covetousness wickedness deceit lewdness and evil eye blasphemy pride foolishness all these evil things come from within and defile a man the reason why we want to include this and look at this is because most people think you know oh i wear my heart on my sleeve right i i I live by I live by my heart, my emotion. My heart guides me to do these things. They're not wrong in presenting that, but the nature of the fleshly heart is susceptible to the devil. And we'll talk about a little bit more of that as we get going. In each and every one of us, right, we have a sinful nature. And we talked about this before, but when Jesus was on the cross, his sacrifice, he performed surgery and separated us from that sinful nature. He pulled us and gave us the ability to withstand that and say, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not going to go out here and, you know, kill people at random. I'm not going to go out here and steal. I'm not going to go out here and, you know, sleep with someone's wife or husband or whatever, right? That's what jesus helped us with he removed that and made us no longer slaves to sin but a slave to him right a slave to jesus so that we would want to do god's will we would want to live a life that is a fraction of of reflection of what jesus stood for right all we can hope for is that we can chase after him and seek him and try to do all things that would glorify him and please him so now, as we go in, understand that uh, the saying, <laughs> it's from a cartoon, <laughs> the mind is willing, but the body is fleshy, fleshy and spongy. <laughs> it's a Futurama joke. For those who watch the show, you'll get it. For those who, who don't, watch it and just type in the keyword snooze to and it'll come up. But... When you're getting into this heart concept where the wickedness and the evilness and the things that defile a person are from within, that's it. You'll find when we start getting into it that the fleshly aspect of our human nature and the spiritual aspect of our, I don't want to say human nature because the spirit is not human nature, the spirit is the spirit nature. But the nature of our being, right, they're always butting heads. It's up to us to tune in and hear the spirit over the flesh. It's up to us to deny the flesh, right, and take up our cross and follow Jesus, follow the spirit. Remember, the spirit, the Holy Spirit is the comforter it is the intercessor that is rested upon us that came down when Jesus ascended. So we have to be slaves to the spirit that does the work of the will of the Father and the Son. Right? So Job chapter 2 verse 4 through 7. It says, Satan replied to the Lord, Skin for skin, a man will give up everything he has to save his life. But reach out and take away his health, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, do with him as you please, the Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. So Satan left the Lord's presence, and he struck Job with terrible boils from head to foot. Now, remember when I said, or I added at least, health and circumstances, your emotions. Your circumstance and your emotions are rooted in your heart and the things that are surrounding you. For example... your bills, your car, your things, you know, your fancy possessions, things break down, right? We all want things to work. 
We don't want to be stressed out, but we carry so much stress with us. We get angry when things don't work. We get sad when we get rejected. We get hurt when someone tells us something that is really constructive and we're not strong enough to take that kind of criticism. We get impatient when someone tells us to wait and we have to deal with all these things. And if we allow the unruliness of our heart to get infected with the words and the whispers of the devil, right, then we're going to give in to that sinful expression of our being, of our flesh, for example. It says here, thefts, right? Most people, um, when they have nothing and they're, you know, they don't have a job and they're on their last, their last leg and they think like there's no hope, instead of asking, they feel like, oh man, if I ask, someone's going to judge me or I'm going to be embarrassed. A lot of people turn to thievery. They steal from someone else or they think that someone shouldn't have something over them. And so they go and take it for themselves, right? Um, you look at crimes of passion, murder, you know, someone comes home and they see their significant other in bed with someone else and, you know, they haul off and they start hacking people up and a bunch of crazy violence happens. And then they come to and say, oh, I don't know what happened. I don't remember doing it. It, I just, I, it was like I was watching myself from, from a window. It's because you've given in and at that moment. The flesh has taken over and the devil jumped in and he may or may not have been possessed for that that moment. And because people are fearful of consequences, right? How often do you know we turn ourselves in? How often do we confess our sins to one another so that we can remind one another not to do those things? How often do we say, look, I was faced with the situation and I could have done this, I could have done that. But I, I didn't do I didn't do what I wanted to, I did what I was supposed to do. Or I didn't do what I was supposed to do, I did what I wanted to. You know, we have to be able to stand guard, guard our hearts so that we don't fall into those situations. And then in that health concept, skin for skin, a man will give up everything he has to save his life. Well remind yourself that in scripture Jesus said, anyone who tries to save their life shall lose it, but anyone who gives with their life for my sake shall gain it. Eternal life, that is, right? And so when here, when he's saying, give up everything he has to save his life, the devil wants you to think that that's okay. He wants you to think that you should be giving all these things up denounce God and live in the moment, live in the pleasure, live in the things that the devil can give you with instantly in this, in this here and now. The only problem is instant gratification is just delayed consequences and, and you don't want to have to deal with that, right? Delayed gratification means you avoid the instant consequences. So, and I know I put four to seven. It should be four to six. So we'll fix that now. You guys keep me on my toes. These, these errors. But. The devil will send people and evil spirits to break you and steal your peace. We've already gone over numbers. We've already gone over Job uh, chapter one, verse 12 to 19. But we're going to go into the second portion of Mark chapter seven. Verse 5 to 3. Notice we went through 14 to 23. And here's the note. Most versions do not include verse 16. Which, see, as you guys saw earlier, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Right? So, as we get down here. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as is it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Meaning, you're doing things for show. You're nice and loud, and everyone can hear you, and, oh, it looks good for the camera. But what are you doing 
with your heart. You're more concerned about following what's written on a page than following the will of God, right? And there are many parables where Jesus denounces the, the Pharisees and Sadducees with God's wisdom. But most people don't. And when I say most people, I'm not saying, you know, the world. What I'm saying, most people in the Pharisees and Sadducees don't look at it that way. They look at it as, well, we were taught to follow the law. There is no man because man, God can't be man. Man is, man is inferior. So because they're inferior, we want to have the power over the law. We want to say who, who's, who does what and who's in the right and who's in the wrong. Everything else is reserved for God, but, but the law was given to us. And since we are the elders and the educated, we get to determine what's right and what's wrong and, and, and dictate. But God was standing amongst them and trying to educate them. But they're sitting here arguing with God and trying to battle their wisdom versus an infinite wisdom, right? And so verse 7 here, it says, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God, Let's scroll this up for you guys. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other things you do. He said to them, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Remember, they want to keep power for themselves. They want to be right and be able to tell others, hey, you're doing it wrong. They want to be able to cast judgment on people, right? But that's not our place. That's reserved for God and God only. It says here, it says in verse 10, For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses uh, father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received for me is korban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer have, um, sorry, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down and many such things you do. And so the reason why this is in this section where um, the devil sends people, the devil wants people who are going to be bound by the writings, bound by something that is concrete because the spirit isn't concrete. The spirit is something that it's beyond the physical, right? The physical affects the spiritual, but the spiritual also affects the physical. But if you're cut off from that because you allow the devil to put blinders on and earmuffs over your ears, you're not ever going to see the truth. You're not ever going to hear the truth, right? The devil wants you to say, ha, ah, ha, ah, it wasn't in here, so we don't want it. Oh, but that's... It just because it's in here doesn't mean that we can't change it. As we're seeing now, there are things that are being taken out of the Bible. There were things that were taken out of the Bible, whole books. That's man trying to determine what other people can hear. The world is run by the Pharisees and Sadducees, right? But it's the world and the spiritual concept. We are not friends with the world because those who are friends with the world hate God, but those who are friends with God shall be hated by the world and hate the world. Okay? So, understand that the devil will send people to try to get you to denounce the spirit and cling to the written word so you are spiritually dead, spiritually asleep. Meaning, Jesus could walk in, sit down and talk with you and you just see him as a homeless person, you know, asking for a meal, asking to share a meal with you, asking just to speak with you, and you see, oh, sorry, I don't have time for you. But then once he's revealed in the spirit, well, well, hey, well, well, hey, what about me? I thought we were friends. Remember that one time you sat next to me? Yes, I remember that time I sat next to you and you rejected me. You rejected sharing a meal, right? I stand at the door and I knock. Those of you who open the door, I shall come in and share a meal with you as friends. Understand that the opportunity is there to get to know Jesus, to get to know God, to understand the work that was done, to understand how to pull off that spiritual death.
that spiritual drowsiness and get to know him in all of his splendor, right? To understand the love that he has for you. Here in Job chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, when we're looking at the taking of Job's health, the devil sends people, influences people to try to get you to denounce God in your pain and in your suffering, to deal with your depression, to deal with your potential substance abuse, whatever it is, right? He wants to keep you married to whatever is pulling you from God, to whatever is keeping you from focusing on God. In Job chapter 2 verse 8, Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. Understand, though, that scripture tells you, be thankful in all circumstances, right? Not just the good, but also the bad, because it's an opportunity to glorify God. Just because, just because your house caught fire, be thankful that you're alive. Be thankful that God put it in your mind to listen to logic and reason and wisdom and counsel to get that insurance on your house. Be thankful that you heeded the Spirit's warning to get out to go check the mail so that you can be out when everything came crashing down, right? Be thankful because now you don't have to live in a house that has a destroyed foundation. Yes, our circumstances can get us down, but you have to be able to take a step back and understand that not everything that you're sitting in and everything that you're sitting around is negativity. Do you think that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were denouncing God in the middle of the, of the furnace? No, they were praising him and thanking him because the angel of the Lord was in there with them, keeping them from being burned alive, just like the guards when the king told them, Add more, uh, add more fire to make it hotter. In all your circumstances, be thankful. Thank God for what he's done for you. Thank God for bringing you somewhere. Thank God for taking you from somewhere. Thank God for giving you things and taking things from you. Because you don't want to be given things and fall in love with the possessions. You want to be given things and be thankful and fall in love with the giver, the creator of all things, right? Love and reverence go to God. Glory goes to God in all things. Understand that the devil would have you distracted and taken from that. The devil will have your relatives come after you. Here we go. Genesis 37, verse 6 to 22. Listen to this dream, he said, talking about Joseph as a young man. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His, his brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Now, to give you a little background in verses 1 through 5, it says explicitly that Joseph's father loved him, right? Loved him dearly out of all the kids, and his brothers hated him for it. And so when we start looking at this, they hated him even more because of the dreams and what they were saying. So you're telling us we already don't like you, but now you're telling us that we're going to be bowing down to you? Yeah, okay. Verse 9, soon Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I have another dream. He said, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers, but his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? Unbelief. The devil would have people doubt you and mock you and scorn you because of the things that God has given you. God gave Joseph dreams. God gave him prophecy. God blessed him with so many things outside of the circumstances that he was put into. But it all worked out for God's plan for God to be glorified, for Joseph's glory to be given to God, right? 
And so here, verse 11, well, while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered about the dreams, or wondered what the dreams meant. 12. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture um, their father's flocks at Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Joseph or Jacob said to Joseph, Your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Get ready, and I will send you to them. I am ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. So Jacob sent him on his way, and Joseph traveled to Shechem from their home to the valley of Hebron. Scroll down so you guys can see verse 15 here. When he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him wandering around the countryside. What are you looking for? he asked. I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they are pasturing their sheep? Yes, the man told him. They have moved on from here, but I heard them say, let's go on to Do uh, Dothan. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan and found them there. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. You have people who are near and dear to your heart, but the devil would use them to break you and to harm you and to, and to cast you down. Have you seen this before in Genesis, where Cain was influenced to murder Abel? right you have to understand that the devil is always going to try to impede the plans that God has but what's a pebble in the road to a bulldozer nothing the will of God will always come forth the will of God will always come through despite the plans that the devil has because the devil is short-sighted the devil is short-minded Nothing can stand against the wisdom, the power, and the glory of God, right? So here, when he says in verse 21, But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. Excuse me. It, it matters not what the devil wants it matters not what the devil thinks it matters not what the devil plans because god will win out jesus has already defeated him on the cross jesus's ascension was a sign of that jesus's death on the cross was a sign of that in the three days that jesus was dead laying or well, his body was laying in the tomb his spirit had gone back and had ministered to every single person that had died since the time of noah what that means is all those who didn't know Jesus and who weren't offered the opportunity at salvation and come to know Jesus were given that opportunity and they made their decision, yay or nay. All those who said yay, boom, were in the gates. All those who said nay, I don't believe it, I don't want it, I don't trust it, no big deal. You go in the waiting room. You have to understand that God is long suffering his plan is not delayed his plan is expanded and it is projected right here we are just because we see things just because we see things that are matching up with prophecies that are told in scripture the end times have been happening for a while and i'm not saying oh you know uh the 2012 or y2k nothing like that what i'm saying is all these things in scripture have been taking place for a while and who are we to determine when the end times are started and ending? Who are we to determine uh, what prophecy is being fulfilled and not being fulfilled? It says it's going to happen in Scripture, so it's going to happen. And when it happens, we'll know about it. And if it doesn't happen, then guess what? It hasn't happened yet. Understand that nobody knows the day of judgment. Not the Son, not the angels, only the Father. Only God knows when all things are going to come to that that crescendo, right? Understand that the devil is going to try to send many, many, many people to try to break you, to try to stop you, to try to trip you up. The devil is going to throw not just people but spirits at you. The devil is going to do anything and everything he can to snatch you from God's hand. But you have to understand that nothing 
nothing can when you give yourself fully to God and I mean fully truly give yourself to God and live in a manner that will glorify him every single day the moment that you profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior you get in your word and you read and you understand what the good news is you understand the gospel you understand the sacrifice that Jesus made and who Jesus was he was Emmanuel God with us God clothed in the flesh as Jesus Christ who was covered in the Holy Spirit right the embodiment of the Trinity you understand that upon his death on the cross the veil was rent we were covered in his blood and we were protected from the wrath of God during the end times we have that opportunity at living eternal life with him whether you are a believer now, whether you were, whether you will be, I urge you to get in your word. I urge you to stay strong and pray and speak to God. Cry out to him. Father, help me. Father, I want to know you. I want to see you. I want to hear you. I want to give my life to you. I just don't know how. Father, please send me a messenger. Send me a message. Grab my life, Father. And show me what I need to do to get closer to you. And you mean that from your heart. You mean that with every ounce of your being. And you cry out in Jesus' name. And God will give you exactly what you're looking for. Don't be afraid. Don't shy away from it. It may seem scary. It may seem daunting. But you will live a more peaceful, more free life. And when I say peaceful, I don't mean... Oh, I don't have to worry about anything and any, anything at all from the devil. The devil is going to try to trip you up even harder than he was before. But the covering that God has over you, the protection that he provides you. Read Psalms 91, right? Read Psalms 91. Understand that no matter what comes against you, no matter what the plans of the devil are, God is with you and he loves you and he's there for you through it all. You may feel like you're bogged down and burdened, but give your worries to God and he will be with you through everything. I mean, we're already at 47 minutes. We're going to go a little bit further because this is uh, something huge. And that way we can, let me see. Yep, that way we'll get through the rest of the red. So the devil is the author of confusion. He promotes dissension and uses distractions to pull you from God. So, here we go. James chapter 4 verse 17. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Now, you can take that as a literal sense. You can take that as a figurative sense. You can take it as a fleshly sense or a spiritual sense. And it's all going to come to the same thing, right? It is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Um, you know that you need to get up and go to work to pay your bills so that you can keep your lights on so that you can provide, um, you know, a healthy environment for your kids, but you choose not to go to work. You choose not to get a job and you choose to go on, um, unemployment, right? A few things, nothing wrong with you going on unemployment. I don't want people saying, oh, you know, he's trying to tell me I can't do that. No, what I'm saying is you know that you have a job to do, but you're being lazy. And in your laziness, you are affecting the lives of everyone else around you. It is a sin for that to occur because you know that you need to get to work and do what you have to do, right? Do not be lazy. It is a sin for you to think that, oh, I've done enough to get here. Now I don't have to continue doing any more. The same kind of thought process there is, I've done enough to where, you know, I've done the bare minimum to, to get to salvation, so I'll be good. Well, you're not wrong, but God doesn't want lazy people. God doesn't want people who are content with doing the bare minimum. Think of it this way. You get to heaven and God says, Hey, I asked everyone to bring a plus one to this party. Where's yours? Oh, well, I figured someone else would bring two, so that should cover me. Okay. Get away from me. I never knew you. 
because you didn't do the will of your father. The Great Commission is to plant seed. And it is to spread the good news, plant seed in fertile soil so that the root can take place at the appointed time that God determines for it. You look at 2 Corinthians verse 11, or chapter 11, verse 14 and 15, but I'm not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get punished. Their wicked deeds deserve. If you are content with salvation and not spreading the news and not trying to reconcile people back, right? Understand that you met the bare minimum to get into the party, but you didn't meet the requirement to help others along the way. And therefore, you didn't meet the command of living in love. And if you didn't meet the command of living in love, then you don't have love in your heart. If you don't have love in your heart, then you don't have God. Because if you don't have love, you don't have God because God is love, right? Understand that you know to go above and beyond to glorify God in all things, not some things. And in that, you are, based on James chapter 4, verse 17, committing sin. Because it's a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. The devil would have you be content to pass yourself off as righteous. The devil would have you be lazy to pass yourself off as you've worked hard enough to earn the right to be lazy. The devil wants you... To get there and then be asked that question of where are your guests? And your response to be, oh, I figured someone else would bring them. My car could only fit me. Right? So we look at Mark chapter 8, verse 31 to 33. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. Noticed in there that there's three groups of people. The elders the leading priests and the teachers of religious law, right? So the elders are the people that you go to, um, think of like the judges, um, the time in uh, the books of judges, but then also in Moses, or in, Moses, in Genesis where Moses was appointed and it was um, given to him, the, the wisdom was given to him to appoint judges at the local level, the next level, the next level, and then finally get to him for cases that couldn't be handled, right? So the elders are the ones who are supposed to be wise. And then the leading priests, these are the ones who are supposed to be teaching the word of God. These are the ones supposed to be guiding you to Jesus. And then the teachers of religious law, these are the ones supposed to keep you honest and doing the things that would please God and making the sacrifices and avoiding the temptation and essentially defiling yourself like the levitical laws but here he's saying that it will suffer terrible things and be rejected by these people he the son of man god in the flesh covered with the holy spirit rejected by man and you're wondering how why this is crazy this is madness but you <laughs> turn on the news and you'll see it it's happening every day Every day, God is being denounced, and all we can do is pray and continue to, to do what God would have us do. Live according to how he would want us, and to spread the word. Tell people about him. Plant the seed. And pray that that person is the embodiment of fertile soil for God to grow roots within them. Right? And then here he says, in the finishing of verse 31, Mark chapter 8, verse 31, he says... He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Remember in the first video when I said that Jesus rebuked Peter, his disciple, because he was saying, whoa, hey. Jesus, we can't be saying you're going to die. Like, we need you here with us. 
again, it was Peter's mouth, his voice, the, the breath from his lungs touching his vocal cords, but the driving influence behind it was the devil trying to get Peter to dissuade Jesus from being the sacrifice so that salvation couldn't be set for everybody. You look at this, the last sentence in, in that verse. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. God has a top-down view, meaning he's looking at everything this way. We, as people, are looking at things this way, linear. God has, if you think of like a cone, so here's a point. His view goes this way, and he can see it all, right? Our view is limited. Our perspective is limited. Our understanding and wisdom is limited. And that is why we must seek God so that we can grow and so that we can understand these things and change our point of view. So we aren't looking from a human fleshly perspective, but we're looking from a spiritual perspective so we can see the truth behind the person. We can see that this person isn't evil, but the thing that is binding them is the the trauma that they may have is a curse put on them by somebody else so that we can pray and rebuke that thing and we can pray for bondage and, and the the breakage of the bondage and deliverance from whatever it is right our goal is to live in love spread the good news and glorify god with all that we do so as you can see we still have a bit more but we will have to cover that in the next, um, excuse me, in the next Bible study. So everything in blue was added. The next color, I believe, will be, I don't know, green, purple. Um, something to differentiate between what we started with and what we're adding, right? So ultimately, at the end of the day, live in love. Understand that the devil is working hard to try to pull you. It's a tug of war. The devil is using both hands and he's calling in all the help of evil spirits. But God is holding the rope like this because he knows that you're not going anywhere when you are with him. The devil cannot snatch you from his hand. Understand that once you've given your life to God, you are his. You were his to begin with. But he's given you free choice to live however you want to live. But when you conscious, when you make a conscious choice and effort to know and love God and follow Him and chase Him, you are you are tied to Him. You are a slave to Him. Meaning, you do all within your capacity to please Him. I love you all. Stay safe. Stay in prayer. God bless. And hope to see you soon. Take care.